Oh, uh, wait, you're listening. <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. All right. <coughs> you're you're listening, listening to Radio Lab. Radio Lab. From WNYC. See? Yeah. Hello, I am Louisa Miller, though I go by the name Lulu. And I'm Latif Shiraz Abdul Fazl Nasser Balu. Um, and here, at, is that, that's wait, my full was name. Is that true? That is my full name. It is stately and ringy and wonderful. Yeah, it's my name, my dad's name, his dad's name, his dad's name, his dad. It's basically, it's all the dad's names. Okay. Uh, and anyway, here at Radio Lab, uh, we are talking about this because we are, we kind of are a little obsessed with names, it turns out. Yeah, it, it's just, it just keeps coming up. I mean, in addition to the, oh, six part series, six, you did lots yeah. of about sharing a name with a Guantanamo detainee. We have done stories about names that make computers go haywire. Names that seem to influence a certain life path. Like a study that shows that if you're named Dennis, you're more likely to become a dentist. But today we have a very different kind of name story Mm -hmm. because our editor, Alex Neeson, recently got some kind of confusing news about her name. You see these wasps? Be careful. And this news sent Alex on a kind of odyssey. Ooh, I'm stepping in mud. Ooh, it is squishy. Down to New Orleans, where she sloshed and slogged. Right. Through swampy cemeteries. Some of these headstones, you can't even make them out because they're just so old and weathered. Sweaty basement archives. Yeah, nothing. Yeah. Trying to pin down where her name came from. And... Not only did Alex take that search further than anyone thought possible, she ended up confronting a much deeper question. Is your name just an arbitrary string of letters pinned to you at birth? Or is it the thing that can help you see yourself and how to move forward in life most clearly? Hello, hello. Can you hear me? Why are you so blurry? I don't know, the internet. Okay. And we're going to start off... Um, I'm just going to have you introduce yourself. ...with the person who gave Alex her name. Clarence Leeson Jr. I'm an Army veteran. I'm a retired U.S. Army colonel. And your relationship to me? You're my daughter. My oldest daughter. So my name was this big character in my life as a kid. And one of the things I used to tell you and your sister, hey, that's my name. That's not your name. It's on lease. The thing you say, like, basically once a day. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Right. So, I mean, because... It, it, it's, it is important, right? As you take. I grew up in a military family. My dad was in the army. You know, twenty years of my life in the army. We moved around a lot. Didn't have like a traditional hometown, and I think I had a lot of anxieties as a kid about like not having roots. But uh, part of that's like sort of like being in the military, or everything is your last name, your last name, and your last four, right? Mm-hmm. You so in the military, your name is sort of. You. Mm-hmm. People are addressed by their last name, living on base. Your name goes on the outside of your house. On ours, it always said Team Neeson. I saw it every day on my dad's uniform when he would get up and go to work. Right. Your identity comes completely ab- absorbed into your last name. I make sure that my name has value to me. And then uh, as you and your sister were growing up, transfer that to you so that you can understand that, hey, look, take care of this name. This is what I got. This is... This is something that I own as my identity. And I just totally internalized that sense of connection to my name. And, you know, I have a nameplate ring. It says Neeson. I never take this thing off. Certain friends, I'm not known as Alex. I'm just known as Neeson. Mm. It's just a deep part of how I think about myself in the world. And then about a year and a half ago, all of that got blown up. In 2021, my grandfather, uh, my dad's dad, Clarence Neeson Sr., he passed away. And he lived in New Orleans, which is where my dad and his whole family are from. And this was, you know, peak COVID. So I wasn't able to go to the funeral, but my parents went. And um, they brought me back a program from the funeral that has like the obituary and everything. It's got my grandpa's name and his birthday, and it lists who his parents were. And so it says, I'm just going to read it to you. Our beloved Reverend Dr. Clarence Neeson Sr., Senko, Daddy, Papa, Uncle, Rev, Doc, those are nicknames, entered this world as a gift to the late Edna Jackson and Wilson 
Howard. <gasps> Howard? Yeah. Not Neeson. What? Howard. And I was just like, Howard. Howard? Who's Howard? What is a Howard? <laughs> and also, where did Neeson, this name that was such a big part of how I thought about myself, where did that even come from? Let me... Oh, hello. Hey. Hello. Can you hear me? You can hear me? Yeah. So I, I called up some of my aunts, Karen, Cheryl, and also my dad, right. and started asking questions. Did you ever learn anything about who your paternal grandfather was? I mean... So they all knew that Edna Jackson was their dad's mom and Wilson Howard was their dad's dad. Oh, yes. I mean, we saw him whenever he was in town. And my Aunt Cheryl, uh, she had like met him. But my Aunt Karen and my dad, um, they didn't really remember him at all. It's a very sparse memory. I, you know, don't, 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 don't. Yeah. I don't know. Because like I said, we didn't spend much time with my father's people. Okay. And, and did you ever? And when I asked... Do you know why we're called Neeson? Um, um, no. Nobody knew. Mm -mm, mm -mm. I have no idea. Really? Nothing? My Aunt Cheryl told me at one point, she actually asked her grandmother's sister the same question. If Wilson Howard is, is my dad's dad, why is not our name Howard and not Neeson? And she said, that was adult business. There's sort of like kids' business, and then, then there was adult business, right, you know? We never really talked about it. And then I don't think my dad really knew either, because every time you talked to him about it, it was like, well, it's a situation. I'm like, what's a situation? <laughs> well, you don't need to know that, but you are a Neeson. <laughs> like, okay. So nobody knew much about Wilson Howard, and they had no idea where the name Neeson came from. And the weird thing was, while my dad and his sisters all feel very much like Neesons, are proud of the name, when it comes to where it actually came from... Well, I haven't known this far in life, so... It's not going to necessarily change anything. At all. They just didn't seem to care. I just, I just never had a desire or an intense interest in it. Really? Why not? I don't know. Maybe it was just... Like Neeson, like this is, I, you know, this is a variation of an Irish name. Like that doesn't make sense in my context. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and so I always knew that like for Black families, the whole idea of tracing your history through your name, it just doesn't take that long before you get to the generation where whatever name it is that your people were going by was imposed on them. Mm. So it's easy to to look back and see all that mess and just decide not to step into it. Right. Huh. But for me, I was like, this is my name. I write it down on everything. I wear it on my ring. It's how I think about myself. And I do care about where that name came from, about who it came from, about all of the people who have carried this name through time all the way up to me. So, like, I'm totally in my closet. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> I found a genealogist to help me out. Okay. Her name is Nika Sewell Smith. And the first thing she told me. One of the sort of hallmarks of genealogy is that you have to literally, like, go down a rabbit hole. This is not going to be easy. Genealogy keeps you in a perpetual state of being Alice. <laughs> and particularly when you're focusing on African-American People, people who descended from the formerly enslaved. Because government documents or records of these family histories, sometimes they're messy, often incomplete, and a lot of times they were never even made at all. The archive and the historical record has never really truly been kind to us. But I was just like, look, let me tell you what I do know. And this is my grandfather, Clarence Neeson Sr., mm -hmm. October 13th. I know that's the day he was born. And I gave her the whole rundown. So, like, what's your great-grandfather's name supposed to be? Wilson Howard. So, but is, but is the Neeson, the, 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 right, the, the but the Neeson comes from don't know. Okay, and I've never like there's no first name like no the oh. Neeson is basically a ghost. Okay, so and right off the bat, Nika so, was like, "Look, you just got to start by figuring out who were all the people that were around back then." My mother, she was like, born in the city, New Orleans. Parents, aunts, uncles, and my father was born in St. Bernard Parish. Get more information, 
get all the little pieces. Because she got pregnant on her honeymoon. Mm -hmm. I lived with my grandparents. And pretty quickly, the people, the relationships, the names. Everyone knew you by your mother's name. You know, my mother's name was, uh, was Marjorie. It all starts to get pretty confusing. Girl used to say that they had this lady that's our grandmother. And nobody really knew that much about that side of the family. But I don't think the lady really was. <laughs> okay. Um, try to keep, like, paper and stuff away from your phone so it doesn't pick it up on the mic. Oh, okay. <laughs> so I went back to Nika, and I was like, okay, the family tree, it has some holes. Less of a tree, more of a branch. <laughs> That's okay. okay. We've got hay. But she was like, look, let's just start looking for documents. The census, birth, marriage, and death certificates. Mm -hmm. Anything where a father's name could be captured. And so over the next seven Same. months, Nika and I started checking in every week. The week felt really long. It so did. We'd look over documents together. So go um, go up to the top. Uh -huh. This document spans across two different pages. And some days, so, there wasn't that much to report. You ever sound like little old ladies. That's what happens <laughs> to old people. All they do is call each other and talk about their talk ailments. Talk about right, what the doctor said this week, <laughs> right? Like, Girl, you know he told me I had to get rid of my bunion. <laughs> and then, one day... Um, so... Nika's looking over this old newspaper clipping, um, something about the draft and my grandpa being sent for a medical exam. Okay, so... And she zooms in on this so, and points to a little tiny J-R right next to my grandfather's name. It looks like your grandfather was a junior. But my dad is Clarence Jr. Based on what I'm seeing, it looks like your dad should be the third. That's very strange. So all of a sudden, it looked like there could be not just a person named Neeson around, but a Clarence Neeson. Clarence Neeson, senior, senior. Correct. So, you know, we started looking for a guy by that name around 1937, which is when Edna gave birth to my grandfather. And pretty quick, I have never seen this before, a possible candidate popped up. So for this, these are convict and conduct registers for the state of Texas. A form that was filled in by hand, dated 1942. They're noting that this man is 25 years of age, 5'6 and a half, 139 pounds. They note him as being Black. Curse at the time, he's a Baptist who wears a size 9 shoe. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And robbery. That's what they claim was robbery. Let's see, date of birth, 1917, birthplace in Louisiana. He's a resident of New Orleans. Okay. Here's another Clarence. He's old enough to be your great-grandfather. Out here robbing folks, allegedly. For the record, he pled not guilty, but he was convicted and he did do jail time. The plot okay. is thickening. It is. Who is this Clarence Neeson? But, you know, now we had a guy and he had the right name. He was in the right place at the right time. And maybe he could possibly be my actual great-grandfather. Or, for some other reason, is just the guy whose name my grandfather got. So I would research him and have him in his own kind of like tree so you have all his details together. That meant more research, more phone calls. I now had two possible family trees. Oh, stinking hilarious. And then Nika finds a key detail in the El Paso Times. This is Thursday, August 27th, 1942. Tucked into another article about this Clarence Neeson's robbery. It says robbery charged New Orleans Negro. Like a specific brand of Negro, the New Orleans <laughs> Negro. <laughs> right. Like I'm watching a nature documentary. <laughs> the article mentions yeah, that a few years really earlier, this Clarence had married an Octavia Jackson in New Orleans in 1938. So we've got a marriage record, but let's, because family... So we go looking for the marriage license. The goods. See, this is pulling up a million and one things. Okay, see, here we go. Octavia, this is the right person. Ooh, she yeah. was 17. Look at him robbing the cradle. How old was he? What he was 21. Mm. <gasps> Whoa, oh, 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 oh. Oh, no. <gasps> oh, no. Do, do Wilson the, Howard. What? What? On the marriage certificate, listed as one of the witnesses, is Wilson Howard. What? Okay. Wait a minute. Wait, the other great-grandpa contender? Yeah. Whoa. He would have been 20 years old at the time. What? No. It, oh, what? Okay, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wilson Howard witnesses. <gasps> oh, no. They were friends? Oh, no. <laughs> oh, my freaking gosh. Okay. Were they Were they friends? We can't know for sure if they were friends or not, but on November 19th, 1938, it was a Saturday, these two men stood in the same room in New Orleans. 
Maybe it was a church, maybe it was at City Hall. Probably they were both dressed to the nines, and Wilson Howard watched Clarence Neeson get married. And this would have been just a year after my grandfather was born. Like, I, I <laughs> cannot. Grandma Edna, like, girl. Ooh, yikes. What is going on? I'm kind of paralyzed because I don't even know. Was it like a, <laughs> was it like a Wilson and Edna creeping on the low situation? Oh my goodness. Or <laughs> it could be the other way around, right? I don't know. Okay, so what, like, at the, what are you thinking, Alex? Like, what's what? So, at this point, there's a bunch of stuff going on in my head. I wanted to know more about this Clarence Neeson senior, senior guy, uh, who is maybe the reason my name is my name. But I also was like, what's going on with Wilson Howard and Edna Jackson and Clarence Neeson senior, senior? And is there a way for me to figure out who actually is my great-grandfather? Ooh. You see these wasps? Be careful. And at that point, I decided we got to go to the place where it all happened. Do you think there are snakes in here? Um, and so a few months later, Nika and I, plus... Whoa, it is warm. Producer Annie McEwen Oof. found ourselves in Louisiana. All right. <sighs> because, first of all, there's only so much you can do online. A lot of things have not been digitized, and we were going to have to go into the archives and dig them up. Snakes? I saw a few of them down there. And second of all, I just had this feeling that I wasn't going to truly understand these three people, that I wouldn't really get it unless I went to the place where they had lived their lives. Sign says walk-in hours, I think. This looks like a decently old cemetery. First stop, we knew that Clarence Sr. Sr. was buried in Texas, so we weren't able to visit him. But we thought it only right while we were in the neighborhood... Oh, Wilson, Wilson, where art thou? ...to visit the resting place of the other man who might be my great-grandpa, Wilson Howard... Where are you, Wilson? ...in a cemetery just southeast of New Orleans. Kind of a squared field. It's next to a baseball diamond. It's pretty crowded. All of the crypts are above ground. And I am just walking kind of aisle by aisle. While we thought this was going to be a quick stop. Ooh, I'm stepping in mud. It was the first clue we had that things down here were going to be... Ooh, it is squishy. Way less straightforward than I thought. Uh. Because even though this is where his obituary said he was buried... Yeah, interment at Merrick Cemetery. August 10th, 1988. And... Frank Santiago. Clayton. Williams. Nelson. Next to Liza Santiago, right. Even though we combed through the entire graveyard... Where are you? We just couldn't find him. Weird. Yeah. In fact... All these people are supposed to be buried here. There was supposed to be a whole bunch of Howards in that graveyard. And we can't find pretty much any of them. So then we thought, wait, could the obituary be wrong? Do y'all know where the Howards are? Then Nick asked these guys who were there mowing the grass. I don't think they're in here, mama. They're not? And they tell her, that guy's not buried here. He's buried at a different cemetery down the road. He said, you can't miss it. And this tip sent us on this frenzied goose chase. He said to go to the red light and turn right. Oh, wait, no. He said there's a fork and you go to the right. Okay, I'll turn around. Into more and more graveyards. Howard. We're looking for some Howard. Talk to that guy right there. Where we talk to more and more people. Oh, I mean, they got some Howard back there, but, um, Wilson. Yeah, Howard. Back there later right down that pool. I don't know. No Wilson Howard. Okay. Y'all, the mosquitoes are mosquitoing. And encountered more and more. I can feel them biting me. It's crazy. Local wildlife. I don't feel any. Oh, wow. There's a lizard. It's like lime green. Hey, friend. Uh. <laughs> After an entire day of grave hunting. Okay, so that, uh, that, yeah. Well, that was not really. sort of anticlimactic. Yeah. We never did find his grave. Ugh. Yeah, look at all the well. weird. And as this fishing expedition for any sign of Wilson Howard or Clarence Neeson Sr. Sr. and any clues at all. Just anything. On which one was my great-grandfather or why my grandfather would have been named Neeson. Continued into the archives and libraries 
and courthouses of Louisiana. Here we go. We're trying to find two people who have been extremely elusive for us. Even though we were doing all the right things. What do you want to start with? Casting a wide net, looking for anything from property records to wills. What can we look at? Anything you want. (laughs) It felt almost impossible. Like we were looking for a couple of teeny tiny needles in a gigantic haystack. Mama always said we start doing family history carry pruning shit. We went through shelf after shelf of these okay. massive old leather-bound books filled with transaction receipts. Neeson is the last name. Okay, well we do it by vowels in here. What is in what is his name? Neeson. Neeson. Neeson and a lot of this stuff was organized in this bizarre system from the Civil War era that they're still using. That is that part of seven to five. You go into the NE section and that's very hard to follow. A through Z and then A2 through Z2 and so on. And you have to look line by line. Uh-huh. Okay. Yeah, it will be. What are you doing? Oh, recording audio. I'll have to approve that with my boss. Okay. What last name are we looking for? But every so often, what is this here? There were these little clues little breadcrumbs about these two men and who they were to my grandfather. Succession of Wilson J. Howard, yes. Like, we eventually found Wilson Howard's succession, for instance. The succession is super important because that tells you who the heirs are. I see Geraldine, who was his wife, Mm -hmm. and then Darlene Howard, and also Thelma Howard Jones, hereby recognized as the only lawful heirs. And so as such, wait they a minute. Are hereby so on this document, Wilson's two daughters are mentioned, but not my grandfather. They did not include him. So what does that mean? And we were like, okay, maybe that means, even though we have all these other documents where he is listed as my grandfather's dad, that Howard secretly knew he wasn't. But also, there was just no way to know if his name was left off that page for some other reason, or if it was just a mistake or a mishearing. Right. Or a clerical error. Damn. And sitting there in that archive... I I just thought that there would be some kind of trail through the documents. I was realizing that we'd come all the way down here for some hard, simple facts. But honestly, I feel like we're still... We've still wound up back in the speculating about uh, a dead man's feelings. Maybe it was impossible in 2020-something to just swoop in, scan a document, and understand the world even just a few generations back. You know? Right. Right. But there was one person who had touched that world and moved through it. My dad has a cousin named Aurelia. Someone who is still alive, lives near New Orleans, and who I'd heard about from my aunt, Jahari Neeson. She knows all the business. And they would have actually known Edna. Does that person go by, like, Rhea or Rhea? Yeah. Rhea Jackson. Yeah, I know Rhea. Uh-huh. Rhea could tell you more. Yeah, Rhea. She grew up in a parish and she stayed in a parish. And she's still in a parish till it's deep. That's how she knows a whole lot. If anyone could tell me what was going on between Edna and Wilson and Clarence Sr. Sr., it was her. Mm-hmm. And I'd been calling her for months, leaving messages on her phone saying, I'm coming to New Orleans, I'd love to see you. Never heard back from her until... Hi. Hi. A few days into my trip. I'll finally meet you, huh? I know. I finally heard back from her. My name is Aurelia Amelia Jackson. I am Edna Jackson niece. Edna had been Rhea's aunt. She'd actually known her. And so right away, even before we got settled for the interview, actually, Do you know why? I asked her the big question. Well, who was, who was Clarence's, uh, my grandfather? Who was his father? Which she answers immediately. Wilson Howard. So I'm like, all right, Wilson Howard. But then... And at that time... She started saying things about Howard being the real father, but his job took him away to see a lot, so some other man stepped in to help raise my grandfather. That had to be somebody in the family, see? That would be family people, because I adopt a lot of kids, too, so that's family people. Okay. I guess what I'm trying to understand is why she wouldn't have given him the last name Howard. She probably was in a relationship with somebody, and they just named the son after him. So it's possible then that Edna might have been like dating someone whose name was Neeson, and uh, I don't think she was dating nobody. I don't, I don't think so. Either. 
But so, so isn't, or, or just, so talking to Ria, I started to realize that we were both speaking English, but we weren't really speaking the same language when it came to family. Okay, so for instance, like if you were to fall right now, and I come and I pick you up and bring you by my house, I didn't put you there because I, I put you there because I love you. She would use terms like family people. And I think her idea of what a relationship is was more expansive than mine. But you're going to remember what I did when I picked you up. So that's the way it was with Clarence Nisa. So, but, so, do you know that there was somebody named Neeson who did all those things? Like, do you, like you, it had to be, or else why would she give him the name? Thank you, ma'am. You know, nobody ain't gonna just give you your name just like that. It got to be somebody that's really know you and care for you. Well, we take care of each other in the family. Don't put it that way to you, because we family that take care of each other. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's all I know, sweetheart. That's all I know that. Even though after talking to Rhea, I was still kind of confused. My head hurts. You ready? Yeah, Yeah. we're ready. It felt like Howard and Clarence Senior Senior, they were who Rhea called family people. Howard was at Clarence Senior Senior's wedding. It sounded like maybe they both taken care of my grandfather at different points. And they both clearly had some kind of connection with the woman at the center of this story, Edna. We're at Ellen's Cemetery, and the gate's open. Who was buried at this grassy little courtyard cemetery, surrounded by industrial buildings across the street from some houses. We're here to look for my great-grandma, Edna, and I'm hoping we can find her. So much of this... We just didn't have a whole lot to go on. And we're, like, grasping at straws so much of the time, it has felt like. (sighs) Sincerely hope there's not poison ivy in here. (laughs) Because that would friggin' suck. Oh, here she is. You found? Yep. This is Edna? Yes, Edna. (sighs) Let's see. Edna Jackson... January 4th, 1904 to October 1st, 1991. Forever in our hearts. And there's an angel. Here she is. I have a lot of questions that more and more I suspect only she can answer. She had a son and gave him a name. Standing at Edna's grave, I felt like it was clear that when Edna gave birth to my grandfather and named him, it wasn't a ploy or a cover-up or a random name lifted out of a baby book. It had meaning. It said something about the community of people she came from. Like my name came out of this mix of family people. But that still leaves me at a crossroads, basically, where it's like, okay, if there's two paths, I can only walk one at a time. So which one is it? Wait, hold what you got. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. And then through the slow but eventual good grace of the state of Louisiana, I got my hands on a very precious document. Okay. Drum roll. We've got all the anticipation. My grandfather's birth certificate. We're hoping that this envelope is giving us something. If anything is going to tell us who his actual parents are. Okay, here we go. It's going to be this piece of paper. Uh, Okay, so on the 13th of October this year, 1937, at Charity Hospital was born a male child named Clarence Neeson, colored. That's my grandpa. Illegitimate issue of Clarence Neeson and Edna Jackson. I knew it! I so knew it, it says Clarence Neeson. I knew it! 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 This is what Neeson's saying. Right. So Clarence Neeson, so Clarence Neeson Sr. Sr. was your great-grandfather, and and so you, you really, truly are a Neeson. Yeah, I mean, well... So first, this is just a document. It's a piece of paper, like an obituary or a succession, like all the others. But it just felt like as soon as I'd gotten this affirmation, another question popped into my head. Who was the Neeson before Senior Senior? And who was the Neeson before that? Actually, who's the first Black person to get this European name? Hmm. Who gave it to them? What did it mean to them? And why did they hang on to it? After the break, Alex catches a break and stumbles on the person who is going to lead her like a straight path through the woods 
all the way back to the beginning of her name. Lulu. Latif. Radio Lab. Grab crumbs. <laughs> Back from break. And then I'm like, oh, this is the best cookie. Yeah. So, okay, quick refresher. I've always felt very attached to my last name, Neeson. And despite the fact that there's sometimes scant documentation about Black people living in New Orleans between emancipation and World War II, I had decided to try to figure out where my name actually came from. And after a detour into trying to figure out whether I was biologically related to Wilson Howard or Clarence Neeson, senior, senior, I'd come across my grandfather's birth certificate, which said his father was, in fact, Clarence, senior, senior. And it could be wrong, I guess, but it gave me the permission I needed to finally go hard. Let's go. At the name Neeson. I'm ready. We get it. Let's do it. <laughs> Next step was finding out where this name was from. So Reverend Clarence, Grandpa. Mm-hmm. And we thought the simple thing to do is to just follow the family tree as far back as it goes. His father. And then push from there. Is Clarence Neeson. So we traced the line from me and to my dad exactly. to my grandpa to his dad. Is, from is, her. Clarence Neeson, senior, senior. Yes, let's go. And then we got his dad. Israel Neeson. And Israel Neeson's father is Levi Neeson. My great, great, great grandpa grandfather, Levi. And then, after Levi, the Neeson Trail seems to dry up. Dang it! Which means, next, we need to find out as much as we can about who this Levi guy was. Okay. Over here. Right. And so, Levi... We learn he was born, as best we can tell, in the 1840s, pre-Civil War, which means he could have been enslaved. But... As we begin to gather documents on Levi, we start to notice misspellings. Leesum. We find his last name spelled Leesum, also Neeson, also... Hold on. Neesum. Neesum with an M. They're just all over the place with this name, I really gotta say. So wait, I mean, there is there a chance these could all this could be a different person entirely? Yeah, because Leesum, it feels like so different from your name now. Right, but whenever we came across a misspelling, Nika would always say... Number one, spelling doesn't count. We're looking for phonetics. Because these forms are often filled out by white clerks who may or may not have heard right or even care to pay attention to how the person in front of them was pronouncing their name. So what do you do? You collect all these different names and then... We need them to be at the same place at the same time. Match up other life details. Got it. And so now we knew we needed to widen our search to include a whole bunch of different spellings of Levi's last name. Let me see. And... Where did the... Wait. When we did... Wait, 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 wait! Wait! What? Oh! Okay. So Nika gets really... Cr- like... Yes! <laughs> she's She's excited. She's pumped. Wait. This is the best news of the freak of week, dude. And I was like, why? Tell me. Hey, you, okay. What is happening? Hey, look at this black man who was in the Civil War. And we got like... <gasps> she found documents that said that Levi had fought in the Civil War. Oh my gosh, okay, this like this opens up, I'm telling you. Oh, you don't even understand. Oh, wait, wh- why is she so excited? Why, why is this such a big deal? Because while documents, specifically for Black people in this era of history, were quite scarce, if there's one thing that the United States does well... It documents its military mm. obsessively. And so... Oh, this is great. We needed this break. After six months of exhaustive digging... Oh my gosh, I might actually do a cartwheel. <laughs> and just basically picking up crumbs. Yes! All of a sudden... There's a ton of information on this car. We learned that when he was 20 years old... Black hair, black eyes, black complexion, 5'7". He found his way to an enlistment office. Enlisted in New Orleans, November 4th, 1864. He joined the Union Army. 11 days later, he was mustered in. Look, bounty paid $100. Which is almost $2,000 today, so... He's balling. (laughs) He is out someplace. Get his life. We learned he joined as a private in the 92nd United States Colored Troops Infantry. There were random details of things he did in the Army. Repairing roads from Baton Rouge to Clinton. We learned he died in 1921 and... Emil Labatt, he was one of the early Black people that had a mortuary in New Orleans. We even learned the name of his mortician. Like, where else are we getting this information about Black people? We never... This era, 
we're never getting it. We find out where he's buried. Veteran cemetery. Oh my freaking God. We find a picture of his headstone. <laughs> Wow. And finally, okay. we learned two super important facts about Levi. We learned his mom's name, Viney, which pushes us a little further down the Neeson family tree. And we learned the name of the parish where he was born. East Feliciana Parish, which is a little over 100 miles northwest of New Orleans. It's like 8 a.m. The sun is like peeking through the the forest that's lining the highway. It's foggy, lots of crows everywhere, um, and a lot of roadkill. Finding the general area where Levi was born is such a big deal because if Levi was enslaved, he probably was born on his enslaver's land. It feels colder here, too. And one possible reason that all these Black people, including me, are named Neeson is because there were white people named Neeson who owned Black people. I mean, it's kind of beautiful, but it's also a little uh, ominous. Yeah. So Nika goes into the archive. Let me just see if I can find any Black or white Neeson, Neesum, anything close in East Feliciana Parish. And she finds them. Neesums with an M on the end. This was a white family with the last name Neesum. N-E-S-O-M, the same spelling that's in a lot of Levi's documents. And the patriarch was a man named Abraham. He was a veteran. He had served in the War of 1812. And after the war, as part of an act that created West Florida, the government gave him a plot of land. The sun is up, so it should be starting to warm up. 600 acres just outside of Clinton, Louisiana. But I actually feel the closer that we get to the coordinates that we're going to, the colder it gets and the darker it gets. He spent 20-some years on this land, raising a family, growing his business, and then in 1857, he died. All right, here we go. And when he died, his entire estate was auctioned off. Succession of A and L Neesum. And in a small courthouse in Clinton, we found the papers for that auction. Light blue, delicate paper bound with like a little rope. The auctioneer had kept this incredibly detailed diary. Be it known and remember that on this 25th day of June in the year of our Lord, 1857, at the hour of 11 o'clock a.m. at the last place of residence of said deceased Abraham Neeson. Where he carefully wrote down. And this is where you get the bedsteads and tables and safes. Every single piece of property that was being auctioned. Looking glass. Axes, wagon. Farm stuff. Blankets, quilts, curtains. All the stuff that you have in a house. Clothing. Rock. And also documented in this auctioneer's diary. Each one of these is a different person. Mm -hmm. We're 33 enslaved people. Negro woman, Amy, age 60 years old. Margaret, Dick, Hillary, Spencer, We've got Sam, Robin. Boy Robin. And this is how we learned that the Neesums were slave owners. Hannah and her four children, Sophia, Negro girl Mary, Negro boy Alfred, Negro boy Louis, age seven. And this whole time we're reading, we're also scanning to see if we can find the names Viney and Levi. Sarah, age 21, and Negro boy Prince. Because if we can, then we'll know that this is where my name comes from. Yeah, some Viney. Okay. And we do find a woman named Viney. Nelson Neesum being the last and highest bidder. Bought by one of Abraham's sons. The said Negro woman Viney, aged 59 years, and her child girl, Sophia, aged 11 years. But this Viney was being sold with a daughter named Sophia. For the sum and price of $1,720. There's no sign of Levi. <sighs> So we were like, wait, oh. it's possible that this is not the right Viney and these are not the right Neesums. I'm fast approaching delirium. Alex is almost nearing her <laughs> end. Uh, she, she's getting delirious. I'm like, you close at 4.30. No, no, I know. I mean, the archive was closing soon and we'd gone through the entire auction without finding Levi. But we had about 30 minutes, so we pulled these giant old leather-bound books off the shelves that were filled with hundreds of handwritten transaction records and just sort of manically flipped through, scanning the pages for the name we We're of hereby aforementioned, like what? Which was a wild and nauseating experience because while a lot of these transactions were about land, one spotted horse, or animals, or farm equipment, doth buy, ooh, I love doth. Amongst all this stuff, 
we would periodically stumble upon... Wow. 153 enslaved people. These giant lists of people. Little William, 11, 11 years old. Humphrey, Peggy. There's a two-year-old. There's an Alzi and an Ibby who were two. Age nine, age eight, age five, age 11. Yeah, these are all kids up here. And even though we were short on time, it felt like we couldn't not read these people's names. And then the list continues on the next page. Because we knew that for some of these cases, this was probably one of the only official records that these people had ever existed. William, five. Anthony, eight. Little P, eight. Henry, 11. Cornelius, three. This looks like Hamilton, three. Mm. Um... And then the next page would be... Corn and fodder. Back to farm stuff. Seven head of horses and mules, land. After scanning as fast as we could through as many of these pages as we could, and just as they're about to kick us out of the archives... 1851, October 10th, 1851. We find a transaction dated six years earlier than the auction when Viney was sold. Abraham Neesom and William... Franklin Neesom. Abraham, the patriarch, is selling to his youngest son... Six certain Negroes of the names... Six enslaved people. Harriet, valued at $650. A woman named Harriet and her four kids. Tilda, a Negro girl aged about six, valued at $250. And tacked onto the end of this group... Aged about four years. We find this small, barely legible... So tiny, we almost missed it. Very, very precious name. Levi. Levi. Levi, A A Negro Negro boy raised by by hand hand. and sickly. About seven years. About seven years, $250. Which Which said, okay, wait a minute. We learned here that Levi had probably had a wet nurse. That's what raised by hand means rather than being breastfed by his own mother, who probably had to work. We learned that he had been owned by Abraham, and we learned that this is why he wasn't in the auction papers six years later with his mom and his sister. A Negro boy raised by hand. Because when he was a sick little boy, he was sold away from her. Finding Levi here was like finding the last link in the Neeson chain. Interesting to have that ring right next to this sail here. Yeah. Yeah. This is where my name comes from, from Abraham Neesom, from this family. Yeah. Growing up, one of the big reasons why my last name was so important to me was because even though we had moved around so much, I felt like the name Neeson anchored me to a real place. Somewhere where my family was from, where I was from. It's from like a gravel road. And that place had always been New Orleans. But now that I learned where this name had really come from and where we had really come from, down to the actual coordinates that we found in Abraham's government land grant. In a quarter mile. Turn right. I had to go there. We should be pulling up. And after driving about two hours northwest of New Orleans... It's just a big open field to the right. We arrive at this meadow, sort of on the edge of the forest, and park in front of this short bit of fence and this massive real estate sign. Becky and Becky. There's two Beckys. (laughs) Where two smiling white ladies, both named Becky, were selling this meadow in plots of land. And it's going to be a housing development eventually. Oh, wow. I know. But for now, if you hop the ditch, (laughs) step around the fence, and kind of climb through the weeds, the field just opens up in front of you. It was filled with tall grasses, wildflowers, You could imagine cows or sheep grazing peacefully on it under this big blue sky. Yeah, I mean, it was beautiful. This was the land where Levi was born. And it was here that as a little boy, he was sick and was sold away from his mother. And now here I was, his great, great, great granddaughter. 
And what I wanted to do was think of something important to say, something worthy of these people. But instead, I just wandered around feeling extremely overwhelmed. I don't really know what to say. And not able to articulate why. It was an orange butterfly just passed. It just landed near me. I just feel uneasy here. And the longer I was there, the more and more aware I became of the ring on my finger. I'm walking around with this name on my hand, on every paper I sign, on every credit card I have. And the name, part of it, represents a horror. And this is where it starts. Like, especially being on that land, the name, it, it does start to feel gross. Should we have expectations of feeling whole when we go back to these, these forced work spaces? Were you seeking wholeness by going to Abraham's land grant spot plantation? Or was it just to see what happened? I don't think I've thought about wholeness because I haven't I feel very overwhelmed and like I can't like it's like it's hard to process everything this whole week right away so when I try to think like how do I feel a lot of the times the answer is I don't know so I don't and and I feel a lot of pressure to have to have a feeling you know a lot of the time the answer is just like it's just soup in my head my brain feels like it's reaching its CPU capacity <laughs> all, of the, all of the fans are spinning yes, it's, it's, oh, it's getting, getting hot, hot. It's, right. it's hot like you can't put it on your leg keep it on your right. lap anymore right. brain is <laughs> how do you move on from this land and from Abraham How do you keep being a Neeson after you know where the name came from? When Levi left this land, when Viney left this land, what did they do? Well, for Levi, after he sold as a seven-year-old sickly boy, the next time we find evidence on paper that he ever existed is when he pops up in New Orleans as a 20-year-old runaway enlisting in the Union Army. And as for Viney, four years after she was sold with her daughter Sophia to Abraham's son, the Civil War begins. There's no trace of Sophia, but as we move forward in time from there, on the 1870 and 1880 censuses, you can see... A couple of Vineys living in East Feliciana Parish. There's a Viney Rogers, there's a Viney Doherty, and there's also a Melvina Banks, who sometimes goes by Viney. And Nika thinks that any one of these women, maybe even more than one of them, could be our Viney. These people are walking into their lives choosing how they want to be referred to. So Viney could have used one last name for a while and then just changed her mind. Yeah! Anyway, maybe the bigger clue Gosh. that one of these is our Viney... It's going through all of the enslaved people one by one. Is that that list of people who were sold on the same day she was? Some of those people are in the same community as these Vineys that I found. Offer for sale Negro woman Amy, age 60 years old. Like, one of these Vineys has a neighbor named Amy who's the right age to be the same one from the auction. And I'm completely positive that it's her because her name is listed as 
Amy Neeson. There's also a Susan and a Louisa and a Millie living nearby. And all three of these people were sold in the same auction that Viney was. It's still the same community of people. And it's in this community that Viney made a home and grew old. And actually, for a long time, we could find almost nothing about her. Until... In 1890, Melvina or Viney Banks submits a pension application for Levi Neesom. Hmm. Okay, so this is the thing that I want to show you. Okay. So if you just click this link, it's an image. Okay, I see it. Looks like an index card, kind of. Yeah, this is from um, a collection of military documents that we found online. Viney hasn't seen her son Levi since he was a little boy. But 25 years after the end of the Civil War, as a very old, very poor woman, she must have somehow heard that Levi had served as a soldier in the Union Army and thought, if he died in the war, then let's apply for his pension. And the kind of small but incredible thing here is that since she's been free, there's been no documentation that Viney's ever used the name Neesom. Mm. But here in this form, it says name of dependent, mother, Neesom Viney. She uses this old name, the name of her enslaver. Why would she do that? Oh, that's a great question. So one of the things that we see with enslaved people is the name that their enslavers had is often an identifier for their relatives that were sold away from them or separated from them to find them. This is historian Dinah Ramey Berry. And I called her up because this is the kind of question she thinks about every single day. People ask, well, why did people keep their quote-unquote slave name? You know, you, you hear that in contemporary conversations. Mm -hmm. But often enslaved people, until they could reconnect with their biological family or the family that had become a biological family for them, sometimes they chose to keep that name. Or in Viney's case, use the name. As a marker in space. And sometimes the only way they could trace after being sold or separated, you know, across county lines, across state lines, was a name. One name. So Viney puts down this name, the last name she ever knew her son to have. And she files this application and she waits for a reply from the government. But there wasn't a certificate granted. Her application was declined because it had already been granted to someone else. Hmm. To Levi, because he wasn't dead. What? Whoa. And here's what we could find out about him. He's kept the name Neesom. He's now a man in his 40s living in a cabin on a plantation just outside New Orleans in St. Bernard Parish, where he rents an acre of land and plants vegetables. He's got some health problems, chronic rheumatism, complications from a really bad bout of smallpox. And about two or three days a week, when he can, he works for an Italian family on their vegetable farm. We also know that living in the cabin with him was his wife, a woman named Celia Hall. We know that they ended up ultimately having six kids named Levi, Mamie, Elizabeth, my great-great-grandfather Israel, Harry, and John, all Neesoms. And we can't know because, of course, there are no documents on this. But it's possible, and I hope, that because Levi kept the name Neesom and Viney used the name Neesom, that they were able to find each other. Wow. Wow. I hope they traveled the hundred and some miles that separated them. I hope that Viney got to visit Levi's cabin. Maybe they went outside in the late summer sun and picked vegetables out of his garden, tomatoes or cucumbers or zucchini, and made dinner together. And most of all, I hope that at the age of 97, Viney finally got to meet her grandkids. It's an anchor. Like, the name has anchored your family. Even if there's been some detours along the way, it still connects you to family. Again, Dinah Ramey Berry. And the quest for family genealogy, as you has, have even experienced yourself, that's exactly what enslaved people were doing live during slavery and in the immediate aftermath and trying to connect with family, you know? Your name has been important to multiple generations of your relatives. Whoa, where are we? One last stop, one last cemetery. It's 
This one for veterans. The grass is green and cut and trim. I don't fear mud on my shoes. No mud here. <laughs> I've come to say goodbye to Levi. 12, 7, 9, 6, 12, 7, 9, 7. Levi Leesum. Just a very simple headstone, very clean. USCT, United States Colored Troops. Here he is. He's right underneath a big tree. Even though he'd been lying here all along, to find him, I had to wade through the horror of one of the worst things that has ever happened in our history. And I keep thinking about to yesterday held a piece of paper that documented his sale as a seven-year-old boy, referred to him as sickly, and then today to make it here, yesterday enslaved and today free. And through that whole journey, he held on to our name, carrying it from enslavement to freedom and onwards. And I keep thinking about the moment that I asked my dad why he didn't seem as hung up on the question of, are we supposed to be Neesons? And if we are, where did it come from? And if we're not, then who are we supposed to be? Then whose name are we supposed to be carrying with us forever into the future? And my dad's attitude about it was hey this name this is what i got here's what it is now and i'm gonna make sure that 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 i honor develop and move the ball with it maybe similar to dad levi thought you know i'm right here here's my starting point i'm moving forward looking back i found a lot of people my people holding on to this name like a bright line through history. Each of us for a different reason as it shifted and changed, connecting us all together. Proof that we were here, that we still are here, all of us, looking forwards. Still wearing that ring? Definitely. Never taking this thing off. This episode was reported by Alex Neeson with editorial and research support from the patient yet excitable Nika Sewell-Smith. It was produced by Annie McEwen and Andrew Vinales with dialogue mix from Ariane Wack. Most of the music we used in this episode came from an amazing group of musicians we gathered here in the WNYC studios. Paul Brandenburg on trumpet, Justin Flynn on sax, Mark Miller on trombone, Kenny Bentley on the tuba, and Jason Isaacs on the drums, all recorded by Irene Trudell. Special thanks, uh, Alex. You want to take those family thanks? Yeah. Family thanks? None of the story could have been possible without help from my aunts, Cheryl Neeson Isidore, Karen Neeson Dykes, Jahari Neeson, Keon Neeson, my uncles, Kevin Neeson and Anthony Neeson, who actually recently passed away, my mom, Olivia Neeson, my grandfather, the late Clarence Neeson Sr., or so we thought, and of course my dad, the person who started this all, Clarence Neeson Jr., or so we thought. And I also want to thank, I guess she's my cousin, Aurelia Amelia Jackson, also known as Rhea. Thanks also to Russell Gregg, Victor Velez, Asher Griffith, Sabrina Thomas, Nancy Richard, Katie Neeson, Amanda Hayden, Gabriel Lee, and Devon Schwartz. And before we let you go, we wanted to tell you about a show that exists in the same orbit or realm of the story you just heard. It's from our colleagues at WNYC Studios over at the show La Brega. 
a show about the Puerto Rican experience. Um, they've just released a whole second season. Each episode is about a different song from the island. Um, I loved one that's about this unlikely salsa hit about a father rejecting his own kid. El Gran Verón. En la sala de un hospital A las nueve y cuarenta y tres Nació Simón that episode ends up becoming this really tear-jerkery story about a father and daughter. Um, but, the, but the story that feels like it is truly in conversation with the one you just heard is called The Moon's Distance. And while in our story you heard Alex clawing into the past to discover that distance can create a closeness that we usually assume can't be had over space and time, this episode claws its way into the future to imagine a kind of connection between a castaway of sorts and their homeland. If that sounds a little confusing, let me just play a brief excerpt from the episode, The Tippy Top, where host Alana Casanova Burgess sets up the mischievous thing that they decide to do. There's a poem, Boricua en la Luna, that became a song. It was written by Juan Antonio Corejer from Ciales, like my mother, and it was put to music and sung for the first time by Roy Brown. Una mujer de Aguadilla vino a New York a cantar. It's a song about not being in Puerto Rico, as so many Puerto Rican anthems are. But the message isn't only about yearning. It's about defiance, about holding on to your Puerto Ricanness wherever you are. It's the ultimate diaspora song, and it gets me every time. The narrator is born in New York of parents who left the island and who dreamed of one day returning. And it's a dream he shares as well. There's a line. He lives with the hope that one day he can reclaim what he has lost. Un Puerto Rico de ensueño. A Puerto Rico of dreams. And then the most famous lines, the last two. Yo sería borincano, aunque naciera en la luz. I would be Puerto Rican, even if I were born on the moon. That line, it says so much about what it means to be from this place and to hold on to that no matter what. Nobody can take it away from us. It's such a profound and relatable feeling. We wanted to push it as far as it could go. And so, for this episode... We asked the renowned Puerto Rican writer Sergio Gutierrez Negron to imagine a new universe for Boricua en la Luna. The story he created is as rich and surprising as the song and poem at its heart, and I'm so excited to share it with you. And so, this is The Moon's Distance. Hi, Kelvin. This is Nanette. It is such a great episode. I love that they thought to do this and that they did it and executed it so well. Uh, So go check out La Brega, The Moon's Distance, or any of all the other episodes they have there. Thanks so much for listening. We'll be back next time. Catch you soon. Hi, I'm Tori Neeson, and I'm calling from Augusta, Maine. Radio Lab was created by Jad Abumrad and is edited by Soren Wheeler. Lulu Miller and Latif Nasser are our co-hosts. Dylan Keith is our director of sound design. Our staff includes Simon Adler, Jeremy Bloom, Becca Bressler, Rachel Cusick, Aketi Foster Keys, W. Harry Fortuna, David Gable, Maria Paz Gutierrez, Sindhu Nyanan Sambadan. Matt Kilty, Annie McEwen, Alex Neeson, Sara Kari, Anna Rosquette Paz, Sarah Sandback, Ariane Wack, Pat Walters, and Molly Webster, with help from Andrew Vinales. Our fact checkers are Diane Kelly, Emily Krieger, and Natalie Middleton. 